So let's look at the U.S. events that, that are important to us around home sales. The first number that we alluded to, and that's sides per agent. So this is one way for us to stick a, a, a thermometer right into, the, into the, the mouth of the economy and come back and see if we have a healthy real estate world. And the answer is, mm, it's a little anemic. Why? Well, because the average, historical average, is a little over 10, 10 sides per real estate agent. And right now, we're operating at almost 20% lower than that, mainly because our sales are not going up, like Jay said, and the number of agents that are getting the business are going up. They're still going up. Okay? It's not unusual to see that with a seller's market, right? People say, wow, look, you can put a sign in the yard, they think, and you can get income, right? There's no barriers to entry. Right. So people can quickly get their license, jump into the market, and it attracts a lot of people when you have a strong market for a long time, and then they realize it's actually pretty tough. Mm -hmm. Well, we don't have the inventory. If you notice, we got to that number in 2013, mm -hmm. basically. And then from that on, that on, we've just been slowly eroding it. And if I went back and showed you the slides on the amount of inventory, you'd connect the two and you'd go, oh, there you go. There's the answer. Okay. Uh, distress sales, no problems here, right? If you look again at the, the percent that would be a normal market, it would be 5%. And we're literally below that, right? So 1% being short sales, 4% being foreclosure. And that's actually considered in America kind of a healthy market. So from that standpoint, look at where you came from in 08. 49% of the market was distressed sales, half. One in every home, one in every other home was under distress. Crazy, huh? No. In uh, Canada, that would have been zero. Just think about it. It's pretty interesting, isn't it? But that's too obvious for us to go study Canada. <laughs> right? I mean, doesn't that kind of flat? You know, being a being a a lifetime professional in my industry, I find it flabbergasting that our own government would have the means to tackle that and instead says, let free enterprise reign, right? Let people go broke. Yep. So again, under this is where policy can actually help, by the way. Uh, we're living in an era right now of undoing policy, un undoing protections. We'll talk about that in just a second. This would be a good example where that might be a good idea to keep it, if you could. That's not going to happen in America. Underwater homes, you have about uh, 4.9 that are underwater. Totally right. That's, there. A, how, that's a kind of the long-term average, right? That's 6%. That's about how many people would normally bought the house they didn't appreciate to their underwater. Yeah. One other thing, we talked about the demand is healthy, but supply is short right now. Mm -hmm. When you look at the number of people, like they couldn't sell their homes and move up because their home was underwater. Yeah. And when those people now are back to equilibrium, they're free to join the market. And that's also contributing to the sense of we have a lot of demand and no supply. You're exactly right. Yep. All right. Uh, Federal Reserve policy. Uh, this, is, this is essentially the cost of borrowing money from the government. And when you, when you, no, what you can notice is, is they will use that in times of economic uh, stress in order to get the markets moving again. And when you see that rate, see the blips where it's high, let's say 19.1%, I'd say that's high, right? Yeah, and you, that's when I got, if you look back, that's when you, I got in the industry. Right, you'd associate that with the recession like right around then at the same time. Um, a lot of those high spikes, the Federal Reserve actually was generating recessions in the 80s as a way to combat inflation that had gotten like way out of control at the time. Yes. Yes, the late the the recession in in the late eighties, uh, that whole uh, uh, eighty two to eighty seven was manufactured by the federal government in order to slow things down. They were just going rampant, right? Uh, so do not put it past your government to absolutely cause a recession, right? They 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 will do it. Yeah, that's one of the things we have to keep our eye on now as the Federal Reserve does begin raising rates is to make sure that they don't get ahead of themselves and actually like slow the economy more than it can take at any given time, which is why watching that inflation number and those unemployment numbers is important for them. So they, wanna, they want this to inch back up. Why? They want to inch it up so that in case they need it, they can drop it back down. The, the big argument was, and if you look at that flat line of basically free money, was their argument was that 
we have if, if the economy doesn't come back, we have nothing to do. We have n- no way. We don't have any of the normal channels or tools at our disposal to actually impact the economy in a positive way. So they're just itching to raise it every chance they get. Now, again, they'll just keep raising it until they cause another problem. Right. Ideally, ideally they'll try to avoid that, but it's happened in the past. And if inflation does get too high, that's their primary goal is to control that. So if it costs some of other priorities for them, they'll sacrifice that to keep inflation mm-hmm. in check. Mm-hmm. So here's one of the biggest culprits in the industry, and that is new home construction. So historically, we would see almost um, a million, a million one new homes brought into the market every year. And understand that a vast majority of those would have been starter homes. So when the markets collapse, again, go to 08, 09, 10, go in there and see the markets collapse. Those builders either got out or the banks would not lend them money to build on speculation. So what you saw was that all of a sudden the spec builder kind of mainly disappeared. And they had to find other ways to finance uh, the building of spec homes. So most of the builders went to the luxury market, right? Easier to sell a million dollar home versus four $250,000 houses. And they would go, they wouldn't do it on speculation. They would go find someone with money who wanted to build a home. And so they would take no risk and the bank would put the money up to do it. And that's been our market. But when you do the calculation, we're missing, uh, and you could look at this a dozen different ways, probably, but our guesstimate is we're missing over 2 million homes that never were built that should have been in the market right now in play. Does that make sense? Yeah. I understand that when the, the first time home buyer doesn't have a home to buy, the people that want to sell it to them so they can buy their second home can't get out. We want to see the new home market uh, be as robust as possible, right? So this just gives you a sense of uh, uh, what's happened, right? The If you look at the below $300,000 market uh, and you look at uh, inventory, right, look at where it is. Yeah, you can see when you look at this, that basically means that we're building 50% less houses in that price range than we were in 2000. We're, we're kind of okay. We're, we're, we're not bad in the middle range, right? The three to 400. But then again, we're behind on anything above 400 as well. So that's the issue. This is actually um, the only bad news about all. Here's the consequence of everything we've said. Higher home prices. Now, if you already own, if you already own your home, it's pretty interesting sitting down with someone who's already bought a house and fully intends to live there for 10 to 20 years. They're going, woohoo! Go! Go, go. I'm going to charge you the most amount of money I can possibly get, and rightfully so. So they're not as they're 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 not as empathetic about it until they go back in the market and try to buy something. And then they go, Oh, I didn't know that <laughs> my money would only buy me that. And then they realize, oh my gosh, I'm part of I'm part of that system. Yes, you are. Yes, we are. So home ownership, this is a this is a really interesting thing to watch. So look at this. Um uh, home ownership. So we have essentially uh, 68.8% of people that live in single family homes. But notice that the number of them that own their home since 09 has been declining. And that's not insignificant. That is significant. Okay. So one of the things we have is student debt. And student debt is, is massive and it's expensive. Right. And as, a, and as a result of that, it, pro, it, it pushes back the timeline for people to buy a home. And you begin to see that right there. You also had the big private equity companies that bought up all the distressed inventory and turned it into a rental pool. Mm-hmm. Hundreds of thousands of properties. And didn't put them back on the market. And, and then you had the, those people who were underwater and short-sailed or went through foreclosure that their credit was not in a place where they could buy. And guess what? They became renters too. Yes. And... and the fact that we have less inventory and people can't find what they want and become a renter by default. And th- those are the main causes for, for that right there. Right? Well, there's student loan debt. So you can see you can see the issue with that. It's just it's staggering. Right? It's the it's the it's the it's the debt that nobody really wants to talk about. 
but it's the bad deal that um, secondary education has cut with its students. It has burdened them with more debt than any other group. Uh, you know, think about that. Probably in the history in terms of a single group. That's, I mean, the average student loan debt, I'm just looking at our notes that they gratefully provide, 350 bucks, right? You're getting close to a, an, a car payment with no car to show for it. Yeah. And that's, in fact, that's impacting their ability to qualify for a home. Yeah. So here's an interesting thing, and that is what happens in natural disasters? So we had one, right, last year. We, we had Harvey as an example, right? So people immediately go, what's going to happen to the real estate market? Well, we kind of knew because we track this. And that is, if they're given enough relief, enough relief to kind of get them back up, short up a little bit and on their feet, the markets come back. Does that make sense? So we just contrasted for you Katrina, Baton Rouge, uh, some of their floods, and uh, Hurricane Harvey. And look at that. Literally within four months after Harvey hit, which was a disaster, they were batting out. They didn't make it back up. So that four months is lost real estate sales forever. Actually, correct me if I'm wrong, is this cumulative? So they not only, the lost sales were picked up and oh, they got back okay. to normal. Sorry. Yeah, this is cumulative. So you can see they all went down, you know, 20 to even more than that in that first month. But by month four to five, they've made up for those sales that they've lost. And they went back on. For that whole time period, returned to go. basically the national growth level. Crazy, huh? What also makes you think about is Puerto Rico. Yeah. Which is which is part of America. It's just not part of continental America. And which you qualified. When relief shows up, markets have a chance. When relief shows up, markets come back. In Puerto Rico, the relief isn't there, and it's not coming back. And I actually talked to one of our people on the ground in Puerto Rico earlier today. Um, and they actually are seeing things start to come back. Like a lot of it's around the coast. They're actually seeing a lot of foreign investment start moving in um, and buying up a lot of those distressed properties that are in the area. Um, but obviously, progress there will take time. They've got a lot of repairs to make and things like that, but they are seeing a similar sort of rebound. Yep. So let's look at luxury and, and talk about that. So let's look at four different things. Number one we look at is can people afford to buy luxury real estate? And the answer is yes. Very, very, very stable, so, right? Uh, you've seen another healthy increase in the amount of people that have a net worth of a million dollars or more. Okay. Uh, where do they put their money? Would they put it in real estate? Very stable, yes. So somewhere around uh, 18, 20% on average, people will put their money into real estate. So people have wealth and they about, about 20% or so of their income, they allocate to real estate. Okay. And so to get a sense of the health of that market, you look at the months of inventory. How are people buying? Well, it's what's, what indicates whether they are or not is how many months it would take to eliminate all the inventory. And this right here tells you that it is 9.4 months of supply of inventory. Well, for luxury homes, that's nothing. That's, that's great. That's, that's Look at the starter number on that slide, Gary. 2.9, that's crazy low. Well, yeah, we don't have enough. We don't have enough. Yeah, thank you. We just don't have enough. Uh, days on market, 94. That's great. In other words, three months, you sell that home. To me, that seems a little crazy. That's Especially fast. when you think about after you've got an accepted offer, today it takes, what, 30 to 45 days, probably closer to 45 to actually get to the closing, mm -hmm. unless you're a cash buyer. Mm -hmm. Well, starter home, 52 days. Yeah, so it took like all of, 66. less than 10 days on the market to sell the home, and the rest of that time is closing. Crazy. Yep. So, so is, the, is the luxury market healthy? Say yes. Yeah, the answer is yes. So your U.S. economy is healthy. Canadian economy is, is actually very healthy, right? Are there, is the real estate industry doing okay in America and Canada? Yeah. The only blip that you see in America is that we don't have enough housing. And there's no way to fix that. They, they, they can't fix that, Okay unless they just went out and started building massive amount of speculative first homes, they're not going to do that. No one's going to give them the money. It's just not going to happen. In Canada, as you saw, their only, their only issue at all is that it's just overheated. Prices are too high. 
and they want to they don't want to see that kind of appreciation for a while they want that to calm down and let incomes in some way start to catch up okay so that's your takeaways from from all of this the um uh, so let's look at commercial real estate. So number one, you look at and say, okay, is there job growth? Because if there's job growth, then bus- that means businesses are hiring, which means they need more space. Space. Yeah. So the first thing you look at is, are people hiring? And the answer is yes. So job growth is good. Then you look at vacancy rates and say, okay, well, let's gauge the health of each sector by their vacancy rates. And... Um, you know, business could, uh, buildings, if you will, could be office buildings could be a little better. Okay. But at 16.4, that's still serviceable. That is, that's a little high. Okay. The rest of them are, 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 are definitely serviceable. And if you look at rental apartments at 4.5, man, that's low. That is really low. So overall, this is not bad news for the commercial uh, sector. Then you look at loan delinquency rates. And if 4% were the historical average and you're at 1.27 in delinquencies, that's healthy. Okay. So then let's turn around and look at the industry. First thing we'd ask is what, what, uh, what does credit look like? So here's an interesting thing about that is. So when we talk about credit, we talk about what we're referring to is uh, the leniency to borrow. And understand that when we got when we got to a certain spot right back in 08, 09 in that area, folks, they tightened up horribly. And right, I mean, it just well, put at a the height, grip on it. At the height of the bubble, a dead person could buy a home. So they did need to tighten it. They overcompensated a little bit. No, I mean, there, there was there was absolutely if you could breathe. Yeah, no. It, it, there were dead people who bought homes. Say, so no, it's not, that's not even a requirement. No income is not a problem. Right. Yeah, we can get you a loan anyway. So you would expect it to to re, to reverse and get very very tight, all red, which they did, right? Now that they've come out of that, they they're starting to loosen it. Now they're trying to loosen it um, uh, responsibly, if you will, and we'll see how that goes. But they're definitely beginning to try to help people that could uh, use some help on um, qualifying, right? If you look at the CFPB, right? which is the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. The only thing you need to understand about this is that um, they're, that right now in the history of the United States uh, is probably as lenient as you'll ever see. We're in a deregulatory cycle. That's the people who have the power now want to deregulate. Yeah, they think we're overregulated. The CFPB controls like whatever is on the closing document that's how we stop abuses there, right? Lending practices, RESPA, all of that shows up here. This is where their enforcement is. Yeah. And so basically they're just saying, we're going to leave the real estate transaction alone. Well, that, that would be RESPA violations, right? That would be marketing service agreement violations. Is that right. right? Yeah, kickbacks, things like that. Right. So if you want to do any of those things now, it's a good time. <laughs> we did want to point out, though, they did just fine Wells Fargo quite a large amount. Billion. So... They will seek action for what we call clear and egregious violations. Well, so how do you ignore that one? Don't act like it's completely the wild, wild west out there. It is. But it's going to be a lot lenient than it has been in the past. <laughs> no, it's the wild, wild west. I mean, I understand they got them, but come on. That's, that's like catching somebody committing a crime right in front of you. It's hard for you to turn your head and say, well, we don't we tolerate that. I guess what we should say, too, is, though, as fast as these things can be undone, they can be redone. Under, so a new people, min, under a new min, administration. That's right. They you get new faster. people in power, they can yep. ratchet this the back way, and they have no problem retroactively enforcing laws around RESPA. Yeah. Uh, yes. It's an interesting climate, business climate to be in, right? Uh, it's a time of, of massive hope. It's also a time of nervousness uh, around protection on, on certain things. All right. So let's look at NAR. So NAR is asked to increase their dues by $30. And where they want to spend the money is in political advocacy, which we love. We, we, that's a great role for NAR. Uh, they want to actually spend money to build technology. I'm one of those very outspoken individuals who goes, no way. You should not do that. Right. Their track record is they're the ones who conceived of Realtor.com, set it up. The guys that ended up running that went to prison. 
They ended up losing money. They got uh, another. They got it, got it cleaned up and then sold it to Rupert Murdoch. And today, NAR in their infinite wisdom has sold the rights to Realtor.com to a private group. So realtors can't ever use the name Realtor.com. That's owned by somebody else. They sold it. That's the result of all their technology investing. So when they say they want money for technology products, we look up and we go, why? You, we're not asking you to invent technology for us. That's not why you're, that's not your, that's not your role, right? When they made a really great shortfall on, NAR did, when uh, uh, DocuSign went public, mm -hmm. your response should have been, what were you doing with my money, investing that in DocuSign and selling it and making money? I didn't know that associations were taking our money and investing our money to make money. Just why don't you lower my dues if you have that much money? Yeah. It's, yeah. This is where I wish we were on like stage in Anaheim right now. And we had 18,000 real estate agents to give us applause or booze to tell us how they felt about this. <laughs> I don't want to speculate, but if they're watching this on KW Connect, they can tell us what they want in the comments. But we're at all time high. There's more realtors paying dues than ever and they're raising our rates. It's all very curious to me. It is, and our people pay, if you think about it, we pay what, close to 10% or 12% of all NRR dues are paid by people that are associated with Keller Williams. Yeah, and we disagree with this. They shouldn't be thinking that way. 